It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that all Ontarians stand with the Ukrainian people, and I know a couple of members this morning used their member statements to, uh, to reflect uh, that very, uh, that very uh, reality. We've all been watching the news with absolute horror, seeing the terror, the fear, the anguish in the eyes of Ukrainian people. We know that this province is a home to one of the largest Ukrainian-Canadian populations in our country, uh, with 375,000 uh, folks of Ukrainian descent. Uh, and we also know that uh, all over Ontario over the weekend, we had rallies in so many communities of people just out to support the Ukrainian people. Uh, the province of Alberta, the province of BC have each put a uh, uh, million dollars each into relief efforts. Um, as we saw over the weekend, Speaker, this humanitarian crisis is rapidly uh, increasing, and I'm asking the Premier today to consider increasing the amount of support that we're providing here in Ontario from the $300,000 that was announced uh, to something more in the range of about $3 million. Will they, will they please do that? To reply on behalf of the government, government House Speaker. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, uh, thank the Leader of the Opposition uh, for, uh, for that question and, uh, and also thank all members in this House who have spoke uh, uh, on a unified voice uh, with respect to uh, uh, what we have seen uh, uh, in, in Ukraine and the, and the Russian aggression there. We are going to continue to work very closely with our uh, our, uh, our federal partners and partners across this country, premiers across this country, to ensure that we do continue to provide uh, the maximum assistance to Ukraine. The, the Leader of the Opposition is correct. Some uh, support has already flowed through the province of Ontario. We've also announced uh, some sanctions uh, that directly that the province of Ontario could impose, but there is more work to be done. As you know, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Minister of, of Labour and Immigration is uh, has, is also seeking to uh, settle more Ukrainian refugees to the province of Ontario as quickly as possible. But I do acknowledge that as Leader of the Opposition, more needs to be done, and as we uh, review how we can assist, uh, uh, additional uh, aid will be coming from the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Good to hear, Speaker, because I, I know that Ontarians are ready. They're ready and willing to open their homes, to open their communities, uh, their workplaces to welcome refugees. Uh, they're ready to open their wallets to provide assistance as well. Uh, as we know, the federal government has uh, uh, has put together a program of matching dollars with the Canadian Red Cross uh, of up to $10 million. And uh, that, I think, is something that encourages people uh, to donate when they know their donation is matched. Uh, it's a really great idea, and I'm wondering whether that isn't something that we could be doing here as well. So will the government consider or, or even commit to uh, a matching funds type of scenario uh, to help uh, raise money for the Canadian Ukrainian Foundation? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, look, uh, we, uh, we moved uh, very quickly to uh, provide uh, an initial uh, assistance package of, uh, of over uh, of about $300,000. Of course, we moved quickly with respect to uh, eliminating Russian pro products from, uh, from LCBO shelves. I did listen to the, the mem member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, uh, Etobicoke uh, uh, Centre in particular. Uh, we did uh, sit down and they did express uh, uh, just what they heard over the weekend when they were speaking at rallies, as, as the member talked about, uh, and just how important it is for the government of Ontario to continue to assist the people of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, and that we continue to work with our provincial partners and the federal gar uh, government. As the Leader of the Opposition said, not only for refugees uh, to settle them in Ontario, they have been such an important part of building Ontario into the best uh, uh, province uh, uh, to live in in this country, Mr. Speaker, the Ukrainians who have come to this uh, this province in the past, and we want to do more for them. We are looking at that as well, but we are communicating with the federal government to see if that is the best way that we can support uh, uh, the people of Ukraine. But more will be done, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can assure the leader of the opposition that. And the final supplementary. Appreciate the government house leader's response, Speaker. Um, I'm absolutely supportive. We, are, I'm sure, are all supportive of streamlining uh, the Canadian immigration system to help Ukrainian refu refugees escape the crisis that they're in and, and come to our, our province. Uh, as we know, these families will find welcoming communities. They'll find uh, families uh, that are ready to support them. Uh, they'll find uh, Ontario businesses ready to step up uh, and give them uh, some work. Uh, certainly, it's something that we all need to 
ensure actually happens. I guess what, I, what I'm hoping to hear, though, from the government house leader, the government side, uh, a sharing of any of the details they might have uh, as to what is actually being done to remove barriers to Ukrainians coming uh, to our province, uh, and also maybe a bit of a sense of what might come next as this, uh, as this crisis seems to be uh, li likely to go uh, get even worse and go even further. Again, the response, Government House Leader. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate uh, the, the question. As I said, uh, when s sitting down with the, uh, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, uh, had mentioned that many of the, the people that she had met with had talked about how important it was to bring uh, more of their family members here so that they can continue to contribute in the way that they have for so many years in the, in the province. Uh, uh, of Ontario, and it is something I know that the Minister of Labour and the Premier, Premier asked uh, the Minister of Labour to ensure that we moved as quickly as possible. There are jobs and opportunity in the province of Ontario. We are looking to uh, resettle up to 20,000 additional uh, uh, Ukrainians to be here, to be part of, of the community. There are so many vibrant Ukrainian-Canadian communities, not only in Ontario but across the country where they can continue to be as productive and supported uh, as they have been uh, not only to us Response. but to the community when they when they settle here so i do appreciate uh, the leader of the opposition's uh, focus on this as the first questions uh, this morning it is very very important and as the legislature we will work together to get this done on behalf of that community thank you thank you the next question leader of the opposition uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Last week, the Premier described our questions about the sec secret ripping up of the Canadian content policy for transit procurement as a little game. Speaker, Losing thousands of Ontario jobs is not a game. It is no game. Speaker. In their RFP for the Ontario line, the government secretly ripped up the 25 percent Ontario content requirement, and now it's only 10 percent for the Ontario line. For no good reason this has happened. The officials confirmed last week, of course, that we were correct, and, call, and they are calling the Ontario line an exception to the 25 percent policy rule. Why would the Premier abandon thousands and thousands Question. of good manufacturing jobs in Ontario. Will he rip that policy up and go back to the 25 percent requirement? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I think it's important to deal in fact. And to be clear, no government has ordered more Canadian-made vehicles than ours. Now, Speaker, the NDP can't have it both ways. These allegations are coming from the same party that demands more public transit, but has voted against every single measure, has said no to every single measure our government has put forward to make this actually happen. The NDP voted against the Ontario line, Speaker. They voted against the largest subway expansion in Canadian history and voted against keeping good-paying jobs in Thunder Bay. Now, Speaker, I know the Leader of the Opposition wants just 25 percent of this multi-billion dollar project to require Canadian content, but we think we can do better. And that's why our government is moving forward with 75 percent Canadian content, almost 90 percent of which will be made right here in Ontario, Speaker. We're going to say yes to transit. We're going to say yes to jobs across the province. That includes Thunder Bay. Supplementary question. Speaker, I'll ask uh, Paige to come and send this over to the minister because the bottom line is we all know that not, notwithstanding what they are claiming on the government side, uh, there has been a big change made here. There has been a big change. They've taken the 25% requirement down to 10%. It says right here, Canadian content. This is the RFP that this government issued. Canadian content means a minimum of 10% of the final value of a car supplied, etc., etc. So you can't have it both ways. The facts are clear. Yes, they are in black and white. This government watered down the requirement for no good reason. They're abandoning good paying jobs for no good reason. Speaker, will this Premier do the right thing? Rip up this RFP. Invest in Ontario. Invest in Ontario's jobs and not send those jobs overseas. Members, to please take their seats. Um, the response. 
Thank you, Speaker. You're right. The, the leader is right. Can't have it both ways. And so the NDP cannot have vote against all these jobs in the Ontario line and then claim we're not protecting jobs when we are. And, Speaker, I want to remind the leader of the opposition that when they had a coalition with the Liberals from 2004 to 2014, 300,000 manufacturing jobs left this province. We are bringing those jobs back, and it's too bad the NDP and the Liberals still say no to the $11 billion that will go back into the local economy as a result of the Ontario Line. Speaker, the RFP is not for the entire Ontario Line. It is a massive undertaking that will create 4,700 jobs during the construction alone. Speaker, we will continue to create those jobs across this province and in Thunder Bay. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, no matter how you slice it, this government reduced the content requirement for their subway cars. They are not building subway cars for the Ontario line in Ontario. How ridiculous is that, Speaker? The Ontario line is not having the cars built in Ontario. The Unifor local president said this. Uh, the president of uh, uh, the, Alstom unit, uh, the Unifor unit in uh, uh, the Alstom plant in Thunder Bay, uh, Dominic Pasquino, uh, Pasquilino rather, said this, lowering that Canadian content to 10 percent just blows us out of the water. That's what those Unifor workers are talking about in Thunder Bay as we speak here in this House, Speaker. It is terrible news for them, terrible news for the company, terrible news for the community. In fact, the mayor says uh, that he's concerned that it's going to hurt his community and their work opportunities going forward. So I once again Question. ask this Premier, will he do the right thing, rip up that RFP, reissue it at 25 per cent, and make sure we are supporting good manufacturing jobs here in Ontario instead of sending them overseas? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. We are creating those good-paying jobs across this entire province, and the Canadian content policy has not changed. At the end of the day, 75 per cent of the construction of the Ontario line will be Canadian. 90 per cent of that, Speaker, will be right here in here, Ontario. Here, but what, here. What, what else has the country done? Via rail, manufacturing the U.S. with parts coming from overseas. Uh, when the Canadian line in Vancouver was procured and constructed, there was no requirement for Canadian content across borders. In fact, Ontario is the only province, along with Quebec, that has even domestic requirements when it comes to transit vehicles. So, Speaker, why can't the opposition get on board and say yes to jobs here in Ontario and in Thunder Order. Bay? The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Not only is this government putting good-paying jobs at risk in Thunder Bay, it is also putting good-paying local jobs at risk for historically disadvantaged communities by not including minimum hiring targets for Black, Indigenous and other equity-seeking groups in the tunneling contracts for the Scarborough Subway Extension and Eglinton Crosstown West Extension projects. An aspirational goal of hiring at least 10 per cent of all workers from equity-deserving groups has been included in the contract for every major Metrolinx project since 2013. The Premier should know the positive change this provision has created in the quality of life of many workers and their families on projects like the Finch West LRT, which runs through both of our communities in northwest Toronto. So why has this government now removed this? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, the pandemic, while tough on all of us, has not stopped us from making progress on the Ontario line or any of our priority projects. $28.5 billion in infrastructure investment, long overdue investment, means a lot of jobs. In fact, Speaker, it's almost 5,000 jobs during the construction alone, with $11 billion going back to local economic growth. It's not just jobs, it's spurring on the local economy, and I can't think of a better time when we are coming out of a very difficult two years, Speaker. Those jobs will continue to provide well-paying families food for pet families and get them through these very difficult times, and we are confident that Metrolinx will continue its fair hiring practices as it has done engaging with community speaker. We are going to get through this pandemic. It will be an unparalleled time of prosperity for the great people of this province, and we're going to finally have the subway systems to keep us moving as well. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
Phil Verster, the CEO of Metrolinx, wrote in a letter to Toronto Community Benefits Network that it would be taking a new approach to community benefits agreements on new transit projects. In her response, Rosemary Powell, Executive Director of Toronto Community Benefits Network, wrote that Metrolinx's new approach does not take into account elements that, quote, have been negotiated in good faith over the past seven years as a minimum standard expected by the community and the equity-deserving groups it is meant to benefit. This includes setting minimum hiring thresholds and targets for equity-seeking groups, contract opportunities for local and minority-owned businesses, and ensuring that there is community involvement. Can the Premier make a commitment that all current and future transit expansion projects will have community benefits agreements that, at a very minimum, include all of these items? Project Minister. So, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And you know, I, I appreciate the question from the member opposite, who I have a lot of respect for. It's an important issue when it comes to uh, equity and, and fair opportunity for all, and that includes in the hiring practices of our public agencies. And I know Metrolinx is no exception to that. In fact, they have been uh, treating community engagement as a priority whether that it comes to community impacts, whether that comes to consultations, uh, giving back to the community, and indeed when it comes to hiring practices. I know Metrolinx will continue to, to work and consult and engage with uh, all of our communities, as is the process to, to this point, Speaker. And if the member has any other ideas on how to continue that engagement, I am happy to listen to that. Metrolinx has done a great job. We count on them to continue doing that moving forward. Next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation and the stellar MPP for Willowdale. <laughs> Speaker, it is no secret that for over a decade, the Liberals who were propped up by the NDP did the bare minimum when it comes to supporting local jobs. When the Liberals were in power, they shipped 300,000 good manufacturing jobs out of our province between 2004 and 2014. Speaker, Alstom's Thunder Bay plant is preparing for upcoming work that our government is supporting. After 15 hard years of Liberal neglect that the NDP supported, workers, especially in the North, have suffered long enough. So, Speaker, through you, could the Associate Minister of Transportation tell us what this government is doing to support homegrown jobs and the people of Thunder Bay? The Associate Minister of Transportation, PTA. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, for the question and his tireless advocacy and passionate work for his constituents. <laughs> Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier, we are saying yes to investments that are good for transit and good for Thunder Bay workers, including a $180 million investment in new TTC straight cars and a $171 million investment to refurbish GO Train. Speaker, if it were not for our government's massive orders at the Alston Thunder Bay plant, those doors would have been shuttered already. The NDP, on the other hand, Speaker, did not support either of these investments, but that doesn't really surprise us. After all, the NDP voted against the Ontario Line, the largest subway expansion in Canadian history. They voted against keeping those good-paying jobs in Thunder Bay. And Speaker, the NDP did not support transit Order. jobs, and they do not support the Alston plant uh, workers in Thunder Bay. Our government is advancing critical transit projects, all while supporting jobs for the hard-working people of Thunder Bay. Response. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, to the Associate Minister for his response and for highlighting the government's made in Ontario efforts. Speaker, the NDP have said no to every single measure our government has put forward to get transit built and use talent that is right here at home. With that being said, it was surprising to hear the official leader of the opposition and her party criticize our government's Canadian content policy here in the House just last week and again today. And Mr. Speaker, in this House this morning, she said you can't have it both ways. They were responsible for propping up the Liberals and voting for all of their budgets and driving those 300,000 jobs, and now they pretend to stand up for workers. Speaker, it's not a surprise to the people listening that the NDP once again simply don't have the facts. So could the Associate Minister please help set the record straight about what our government is doing to ensure that vital Canadian content will be used in our critical transit projects? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And the member raises a very important issue. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, no government has ordered more Canadian-made vehicles than ours. If it were up to the NDP, and we've heard it in question period this morning, doing the bare minimum would be fine when it comes to supporting local jobs. In fact, the Leader of the Opposition just wants 25 percent of the multi-billion dollar Ontario line to require Canadian content. Well, Speaker, our government disagrees, so we're moving forward with its 75 percent Canadian yeah. content, 90 percent of which will be made right here in Ontario. Speaker, make no mistake, it is our government that continues to say yes to deals that will Order. get much-needed transit built and keep jobs right here in Ontario where they belong. Yeah. Yeah.
The next question, the member for London West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last month, the Premier and his Conservative government appointed Jeffrey Lang, a former failed federal Conservative candidate and a current deep-pocketed PC Party of Ontario donor as president of the WSIB. For his donation and years of loyalty to the Conservative Party, Lang is being rewarded with a cushy $440,000 per year salary in his new role. That is six hundred. Okay, I have to interrupt the member. Um, it's against the rules of the House to impute motive. I'll allow you to conclude your question, but you can't continue to do that. I withdraw, Speaker. That is $66,000 more than the last WSIB president made and more than four times what the everyday Ontario worker makes. Speaker, why is this government clawing back money from injured workers and using it to pad the pockets of PC insiders and the Premier's donors? Government House Leader. Well, Speaker, actually, we're not doing that at all. What we're doing what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is, is reducing the premiums that our small Order. and medium job creators have to pay for WSIB because the system is managed better while maintaining the levels of support for workers. Now, Mr. Speaker, on top of that, on top of that, Mr. Speaker, we are actually putting in place the environment where more people actually get a job in the province of Ontario, which more people working means more people who would be paying into the WSI. Order. Mr. Speaker. A lot of order. that is because of the hard work of this Premier and this Minister of Economic Opposition Development, come to order. Operation and Trade, but it is because of the policies that this party has put in place. We saw how jobs fled this province under the 15 years that the Liberals and NDP worked together to destroy the province of Ontario. Fox. We're cutting red tape, Mr. Speaker. We're putting more money back in the pockets of small, medium and large job creators. We've managed WSIB and put billions of dollars back into the pockets. Supplementary question. Speaker, there is no question that this government's low-wage policies have made times very tough right now for Ontario workers, but apparently it's never been a better time to be a PC party donor and insider. On top of his lucrative six-figure salary, Lang also gets seven weeks of paid vacation and a nice little pension. And if his appointment gets revoked for any reason, he'll get a bonus of his entire yearly salary paid out in a lump sum. Wow. So again, my wow. question to the Premier. Why is he making Ontario workers pay one of the Premier's buddies to claw back their benefits and make their lives worse? Government House Leader. Actually, Mr. Speaker, what we've done is put, I think it's over $2.2 billion back into the pockets of the small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and we've maintained the level of support for workers. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. It costs less to yeah. run the WSIB in the go. province of Ontario. We've been able to maintain Order. the support for injured workers when it's needed, Speaker. Moreover, there are more people working in the province of Ontario because of the policies that we have put in place, which means more people who actually can access WSIB, Speaker. This is good news. It's good news for our small businesses. It's good news for our medium and large job creators. It's even better news for the workers of the province of Ontario who want and have looked for a government that put in place policies so that they could afford to live, work, invest in this province, Mr. Speaker. This is what this government has put in Response? place. And while they vote against all of these measures meant to make Ontario the best place to live, work, invest, and raise a family, we'll continue to do just that, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Next question. The member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, it's been a heartbreaking uh, five days. Uh, the illegal invasion of the Ukraine by Vladimir Putin is a clear violation of their sovereignty and attack on democratic freedoms for everyone around the world. Women and men, regular people, teachers, accountants, students are now learning how to make Molotov cocktails and fire automatic weapons. As we see mothers and grandmothers take their kids on uh, kilometers long treks across the country in freezing cold without water uh, and with uh, very few of their possessions. The people of Ukraine need our support, not only our words, Mr. Speaker, but our dollars. The government mm -hmm. of Alberta has contributed a uh, million dollars already. I appreciate the $300,000 that the government's already committed, but we can do more. Ontario is the economic engine of the country. We are the most prosperous province in this country. 
The government can and must do more. Will the government Question. commit to matching every dollar donated by individual Ontarians to humanitarian need in the Ukraine? And government House Leader. I uh, thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for the, the question and uh, thank all members of the House again for uh, allowing us to uh, maintain the emphasis on, uh, on how we can help uh, 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 the people in Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. It is truly amazing that uh, uh, the, the strength of the Ukrainian people to fight back against an onslaught of a brutal dictator and for him to think that he can beat the people of Ukraine in their spirit. And we're seeing across this country, across this province, just how fierce that opposition to that is, Mr. Speaker. I know very well that uh, more can be done. The province understands that. That's why we are uh, opening up uh, uh, and working with the federal government, insisting that, look, we can bring more Ukrainians to, to Ontario. We need them. We need them to help build an even better Ontario. We know that there's more that we can do financially, but we want to work with our partners to make sure that whatever support that we give Response. is the maximum support and will help the most people, Mr. Speaker. So I do appreciate the question. It is important. Ontario can do more, and we will be doing more. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know everyone appreciates uh, the government's attention to date. Uh, but despite the propaganda, propaganda, excuse me, the war in the Ukraine is bearing a heavy toll on civilians. Roads and bridges are bombed. Apartment buildings targeted by missile strikes. The United Nations is appealing for billions over the next several months to address what there is what they're calling a looming humanitarian crisis. We've already seen over a half million. Uh, refugees fleeing to neighboring uh, countries, Mr. Speaker. It's a human catastrophe that will require all of us to come together and do everything we can in Canada and, of course, here in Ontario. It's not partisan or, or ideological, Mr. Speaker. It's about our shared humanity. The government has announced some help, and it's appreciated, as I've said, but it can do more. I believe that this government must reflect the generosity of its people, Mr. Speaker. That generosity can be bolstered by uh, a, a matching contribution by their government. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government match dollar for dollar Question. every contribution from Ontarians to humanitarian uh, aid in Ukraine? Government House Speaker. Speaker, and again, thank the thank the member for that question. I know that the Minister of uh, uh, Multiculturalism uh, uh, also, uh, multiculturalism, also hosted a roundtable with the member for Etobicoke uh, Lakeshore, Etobicoke Centre, Mississauga East Cooksville, and the Mississauga Centre with UK, uh, Ukrainian Canadian uh, Foundation, Mr. Speaker. And what we heard, uh, or Congress, excuse me, what we heard is first and foremost, they wanted opportunities to bring people, their relatives, to Canada. That was very, very important to them. So. We are moving on that, Speaker, up to 20,000 and more. If we can do more, we will absolutely do more. I think the Premier was very clear on that. We move very quickly to limit exports uh, uh, that we could control, that the province of Ontario could control with respect to the LCBO, to eliminate Russian imports uh, uh, of spirits into, uh, into uh, Ontario. We move very quickly Response. with, as the member acknowledged, 300,000. But there is more to be done, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. In the province of Ontario and the people of the province of Ontario, we will be there. There will be more done, Mr. Speaker, and we will help them get through this once and for all. Thank you. Next question. The member for Mississauga, Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I've met with many constituents in my riding and heard over and over again how critical the measures we took to protect people's health and economy in our community. So with the 2021-2022 tax season fast approaching, could the minister tell us how the government plans to deliver on the commitment to put more money in the pockets of Ontarians with tax credits to support seniors, workers, and families? Here, here. Good one. I recognize the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank my uh, colleague, the great member from Mississauga Lakeshore, for the great question. Speaker, the people of Ontario work hard, and our government understands that taxpayers are under significant pressure. We have been unwavering in our commitment to make every necessary resource available to protect the people and the jobs of this province. And that's why, as Ontarians gear up for another tax season, I want to encourage everyone to explore the credits that they're eligible for. Speaker, the Child 
care access and relief from expense, the care tax credit, which provides families with the flexibility they need to choose the right child care option that works best for them while putting more money back in the pockets of families. Mm -hmm. Jobs training tax credit, Mr. Speaker, that helps workers get the training they need for a career shift, a retraining to sharpening up their skills, Mr. Speaker. The seniors home safety tax credit that helps seniors make their homes safer and more accessible so that they can stay in their homes longer. Speaker, these are just some of the tax credits we've introduced that have put more money into the pockets of seniors, workers, and all Ontarians. Yeah, yeah. Mr. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the par parliamentary assistance for that response. It's great to hear that this government is doing so much for workers to make sure Ontarians get to keep more money in their heart in their in their pockets. I'm proud to be part of a government that's fighting for every Ontarian and taking the right steps to help Ontarians thrive in these uncertain times. After 15 years of Liberal mismanagement, it is good to hear part of the government that is working for the taxpayers. But many of my constituents and Ontarians don't know enough about the credits being offered. So, Speaker, through you, could the PA give us some more details on these tax credits and what they mean for workers and for seniors and families in Ontario? Thank you. Can you reply? Once again, parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I thank the member for, for their question. Speaker, some of the credits that are being offered on top of the ones that I listed to support Ontarians are is the uh, low-income individuals and families, the lift tax credit, Mr. Speaker, that provides up to $850 each year in Ontario personal income tax relief to low-income workers, the seniors' public transit tax credit, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario energy and property tax credit that helps low- to moderate-income individuals and seniors with property taxes and taxes on energy costs. Ontarians should also save their receipts for local travel in 2022, Mr. Speaker, to claim the staycation tax credit next tax season. Speaker, all of the tax credits built on our plan to make life more affordable for Ontarians are designed to do just that, and that's why we're increasing the minimum wage to $15 per hour, giving more than 760,000 workers a raise, Mr. Speaker, eliminating license break renewal fees for Ontarians. Speaker, Response. we are the only party that says yes to Ontarians, and we're going to continue on that path. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontarians are being crushed by the skyrocketing price of housing. People are sleeping in parks because they've got nowhere to go. Families need to earn upwards of $118,000 a year just to find an average two-bedroom home in Toronto, and first-time home buyers have completely given up on finding a home that they can afford. But the province's new housing affordability report explicitly states that building affordable housing was completely outside their mandate. Nor does the province's housing report once mention rent control or provide any recommendations to make housing affordable for people who rent. My question is this to the Premier. What is the government's plan to invest in affordable housing and provide better protections for renters so everyone can live in a safe and affordable home? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we actually started working on this right from day one. We knew that more had to be done in the province of Ontario with respect to ensuring affordability, making sure that people had an opportunity to live in a decent housing. That is why we brought forward the More Homes, More Choice. Uh, speaker, that is why we brought in transit-oriented communities. That is why every single session of this parliament we brought in red tape reduction bills so that we could get out of the way and more homes could be built. That is why the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has, uh, has organized uh, uh, roundtables with big city mayors, with AMO, to find better ways of getting shovels in the ground quicker. Now, when you talk about affordable housing, Mr. Speaker, in the decade and a half that the previous two governments, the Liberal and NDP coalition era, Speaker, uh, were in charge, of course, purpose-built rental housing, and, and far too often, Mr. Speaker, that was the attitude of Liberals, right? If you brought them something, they laughed at you, right? Because it, they, they couldn't solve anything. But Response. under this government, Speaker, under this government, over the last two years, 23,000 purpose-built yeah. rental units have been brought on. More to be done for sure. This is just our first term. The second, third, and fourth will be Thank you. Next, supplementary question. Once again, the University Thank you, Speaker. 
If this government was truly committed to housing affordability, they would have taken steps in the first 100 days of their mandate, not in the final 100 days of their mandate. Home prices in Ontario have tripled in the past 10 years, making home ownership nearly impossible, but all for the wealthiest Ontarians. But do you know who can buy? Investors and multiple property owners. They have become the largest segment of buyers in Ontario's real estate market. But you wouldn't know that from looking at the government-appointed task force's housing report. In fact, this report doesn't make one recommendation, one recommendation on how to reduce demand from speculators. Building new homes is vital. But these homes must be built to meet the needs of Ontarians who want to buy one home not an investor who wants to buy their 18th home. Premier, what are you going Question. to do to clamp down on housing speculation and help first-time home buyers? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I congratulate the NDP. What we've seen, a transition in the NDP unlike anything I've ever seen in this <laughs> parliament alone. So the NDP, who was at one time so against oil and gas, actually supported a motion from the member uh, for Sarnia yeah. to support our oil and gas sector, and now, now we're hearing that they're in favour of cutting taxes for the people of the province of Ontario. Apparently, now, now nobody will believe them on that. Nobody will believe them, of course, because when they had the opportunity, all they did was fill their pockets, and by there I mean the government of Ontario's pockets at the expense, at the expense of the taxpayer, Mr. Speaker, at the expense of the taxpayer. But look, I, I guess what I'm going to have to do, colleagues, is I'm going to have to send over the NDP some PC party memberships, <laughs> because finally, finally, after over 150 years, they Spons. understand that cutting taxes, cutting red tape, and putting more money in the pockets of the people of the province of Ontario makes for a better province. Congratulations! Start the clock. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, you recently said that you were done with VAX passes. You stated that you didn't want them in the first place. Went along with recommendations from who? Dr. Moore? Science table? Campaign manager? Others? Premier, many question your sincerity in getting rid of the passes. Others wonder if the millions of unvaccinated people will be able to enjoy supporting local businesses, go to restaurants, concerts, or even sporting events. My question, if you were removing the VAX passes as an election ploy only to have Prime Minister Trudeau implement a federal VAX pass program, which would result in punishing all of the fringe minorities, probably after the June 2nd election. We both know this two-tier system has divided families and friends. Ontarians need to know now, not after the election, what your true intentions are. Are you planning Question. on supporting Prime Minister Trudeau if he moves forward with mandatory federal vaccine passes, which, by the way, is fully supported by the federal NDPs? I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor, and to reply on behalf of the government. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, on the continuing path of good news for the people of the province of Ontario, as of uh, midnight tonight, of course, many of the mandates uh, uh, will be removed. So I want to just really congratulate the Minister of Health, uh, who has done an incredible job, of course, Minister of Children, Community and uh, Social Services uh, also as well, and, and, and quite frankly, all, all members, if I, if I can. This legislature has had a very challenging uh, couple of years, and I think despite the fact that we may have uh, disagreed on a lot of things, uh, Speaker, Ontario is coming out of this stronger than ever before, uh, Speaker. So, so look, to the honourable the honourable member, I hope he will uh, celebrate the fact that we are in a position uh, as of midnight tonight to remove those uh, most of the restrictions uh, uh, that really, quite frankly, Speaker, by working with our medical uh, our medical professionals Response. by working with the Chief Medical Officer of Health has allowed Ontario to do better than almost any other jurisdiction in the world, Speaker. I think that's good news for the people of the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. 
Uh, earlier this year, the Minister of Health came out strong against doctors who she claimed were spreading misinformation about treatments for COVID patients. She empowered the College of Physicians and Surgeons to investigate doctors who were following the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm. Instead, CPSO muzzled these doctors in their pre-treatment of COVID patients, threatened to take away all medical licenses, and in some cases, doctors were told they could lose their hospital privileges. That's just wrong. They, just, they didn't want patients going to the hospital to be given remdesivir uh, that creates kidney problems and end up on a ventilator. Unlike the science and advisory tables, frontline doctors were saving lives without prescribing vaccines. Yet, because their narrative was different from the science table, doctors were penalized. So, Premier, my question to you is, did you give the Minister of Health permission to tell CPSO to clamp down on doctors who had successful alternative ways of treating COVID patients? And once again, remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health. Thank you. What we've, our government has been following is the uh, clinical advice, the science around vaccination, which is, has been accepted by 99% of the physicians across Ontario. And look at the numbers. We've seen the numbers come down significantly. Today, we have 849 people in hospital with COVID, down from several thousand not that long ago, uh, 279 people in ICU. The best way to deal with COVID is vaccination. One dose, two doses, and three doses if, if, if you need that and you're in the age group that requires that. That is what the experts recommend. That is what we're following. And that's why we're going to be able to come out of this pandemic with uh, opening again as of tomorrow, uh, midnight tonight for tomorrow. That is all because of vaccination. Here, here, here. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Associate Minister of Digital Government. You know, last week I listened in the House uh, as the Minister spoke so eloquently about Bill 84, the Fewer Fees and Better Service Act. And I know now more than ever, the people of my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and all across Ontario are counting on government to lay the foundations for certainty and stability in the economy for people, communities, and businesses across our province. Speaker, as we prepare for the future, digital government will have a key role to play in the transformative actions needed to make it easier for people and businesses to interact with government. So, Speaker, through you, could the Associate Minister of Digital Government uh, tell us how his ministry is helping cut red tape for the people of Ontario? Recognize the Associate Minister for Digital Government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of uh, Tropical Lakeshore for the question. I would first like to take a moment to thank my colleagues, Minister Fideli and Minister Tangri, for bringing the Fewer Fees, Better Services Act forward. Mr. Speaker, with this bill, we are continuing to correct the former Liberal government's mismanagement. In this case, we are doing that by creating customer service guarantees because, as we all know, you cannot take the people of Ontario for granted. These guarantees will cover everything from how long it takes for paperwork to be processed after it has been submitted to letting people know that the government has received their paperwork in the first place. I'm very proud to tell you that my talented team at the Ontario Digital Service will be the one building the platform that will track this progress. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister of Digital Government for that answer. You know what? It is great to hear how government will continue to improve customer service. For almost four years, our government has been cutting red tape and putting money back in the, money, money back in the pockets of regular Ontarians. And you know what? As progressive Conservatives, we will continue to do just that. Speaker, to continue to lead the world when it comes to health care, protecting workers, and building infrastructure, Ontarians need a government committed to providing digital services and solutions and to offer government services online. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the Associate Minister of Digital Government tell us how the promise of a customer service guarantee will help build an Ontario that puts people first? Yeah, here, good. <laughs> Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. If passed, 
This bill will require ministries with service guarantees to track how often they fail to meet their customer service guarantees. From that information, we are going to create publicly available report cards for each ministry so that they are held accountable to their service standards. This approach will encourage all ministries across government to find innovative ways to improve customer service. And we at the Ontario Digital Service are excited to help them plan, build, and implement those solutions. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario have a right to know if the government isn't serving them well and if the government is holding up its end of the bargain. With these new transparency Response. requirements, we are helping citizens stay informed and empowering them to hold the government accountable. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After decades of underfunding and additional pressures on our health system from COVID-19, Ontario's surgical backlog has become unbearable. I recently spoke with Daria, a constituent in my riding of Toronto Centre. She said that, I quote, I'm a 27-year-old who was recently diagnosed with cancer. I've been waiting for surgery since August of 2021. Surgery is the only treatment for this type of cancer to prevent spread, end quote. Speaker, last month, Daria's surgery date was cancelled and has not been rescheduled. She doesn't know when she will get the life-saving cancer surgery that she needs. Premier, will this government commit to expanded funding that the Financial Accountability Office says is needed to ensure that Daria can get the surgery that she needs to treat her cancer? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. It is critical that we address the growing needs of people who have been waiting for surgeries or diagnostic procedures in Ontario. So we have made the investments that you've suggested. Part of our $1.8 billion investment into hospitals included $300 million in order to speed up those surgeries to be able to hold them on weekends, in the evenings. To that, we added another $200 million last fall. This funding will ensure that hospitals can expand their hours significantly to address those needs. But I would also indicate to the member opposite that if someone has had an emerging, an urgent surgery that's life-threatening through the course of this entire pandemic, the necessary steps were taken so that they did receive those surgeries, notwithstanding the provisions of Directive Number 2, which postponed most surgeries. If it was life-threatening, people got those surgeries. And then in 2020-2021, the average Ontario hospital completed 88% of their targeted surgical allocation. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, Daria's story is just one example of how our health system is barely hanging on by a thread. I've heard from nurses who are demoralized because of how they feel treated by this government. One constituent, Damara, who's a nurse, told my office that I quote, Today I find myself working in a profession that does not allow financial compensation to keep up with inflation. For instance, food prices have risen 4%, and I have been informed by my landlord that he wishes to increase my rent by $500 a month. End quote. Speaker, I don't know how this government thinks it can clear a surgical backlog when healthcare workers like Damara are leaving their jobs because they are so overworked and underpaid. And I don't know who exactly this government thinks can afford a $500 a month rent increase as a frontline worker in this province. Speaker, th through you to the Premier, will your government finally provide adequate funding to clear the surgical backlog Question. and repeal Bill 124 so that we can actually keep and recruit enough nurses and health care workers to keep our health system operational. And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in addition to the financial increases we've made to allow to us to catch up with the surgical backlogs, we've also invested over $5 billion since this pandemic began to create over 3,100 more beds in Ontario because they were not dealt with by the previous government. We knew we needed to increase that capacity to deal both with the COVID patients and now with the patients that need our help to deal with those surgeries. $5.1 billion for the beds, which are going to stay open 
to allow for us to complete those surgeries. But we also have a strong uh, hum health human resources policy now to help those nurses. We know that nurses need more help. We know that some of them are burnt out. We want to, we're training more nurses. We are out, uh, creating laddering programs to out allow them to ladder up. So in addition to having the beds, we know we need to have the people, and we are spending hundreds of millions Response. of dollars to make sure that we have the necessary order. human resources in order to deal with those prolonged and, and protracted surgeries. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Every other province and territory in this country has been able to negotiate a child care agreement with the federal government. Every other Premier and the res minister responsible of different party stripes understands the importance of child care to families in their jurisdictions. Every other premier in the country has understood that at this moment, as the world starts to recover from the COVID pandemic, it's even more critical for women that they have the support of reliable, affordable child care if they're to return to the workforce. Every other government has managed to reach a deal before the end of the fiscal year on March 31st so that they could receive the money earmarked for this year. Does this government plan to reach a deal with the federal government in order to take advantage of the $1 billion that is on the table for this year alone so that families in Ontario can begin to enjoy the same benefit as families across the country? Respond, Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I will remind her that no other premier in the history of Ontario since Confederation increased child care prices more than the member opposite, and that's an indefensible record. Order. Families are paying the price tens of thousands of dollars every single year, Speaker, to pay for an unaffordable system that remains inaccessible, not just in rural, but increasingly in, in urban centres in the province of Ontario. That is the legacy of the former Liberal government. And no one believes that Stephen Del Duca is going to be the great savior of affordability when the opportunity was before members opposite to allow $1.8 billion, roughly $1,200 in literal cash payments to parents to help offset this pandemic. You voted against that. But the premier of this province is going to stand up to Justin Trudeau to get the best deal for the people of this province. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker. What is challenging to understand is why this government doesn't believe that working with the federal government is the way to access that $10-plus billion that's on the table for Ontario. This government, Mr. Speaker, as recently as last week, has not even sent a detailed plan to the federal government. They are not even in negotiations. They have, they have not engaged with the federal government, so they are not going to be able to get a deal if they don't have that conversation, Mr. Speaker. You know, many times this government has sung the praises of, it, of itself, of its own actions in building childcare spaces, which actually, Mr. Speaker, was a continuation of the work that Order. we were doing. They are building the next tranche of the, of the 100,000 childcare spaces that we began to build. But, Mr. Speaker, at the time that we were in government, there was not $10-plus billion on the table for affordable childcare. Question. Why has this government not given a fully detailed plan to the federal government, why are they not engaged, and when will they sign a child care deal for the people of Ontario? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. We're going to continue to work hard, continue to negotiate with the federal government. Where we differentiate with the Del Duca Liberals is that we're prepared to stand up to our federal cousins for the interests of Ontario taxpayers. We're prepared to stand up for the people of this province who demand the province of Ontario get the best deal for Ontario families. We are not going to abdicate that responsibility. We're not going to play second fiddle to the Prime Minister. We're going to defend the interests of families. We're going to get a $10 deal, and we're not going to rest until Order. we deliver that for the people of this province. Order. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Sue McKean is a constituent in my riding. She has experienced dental deterioration over her life, which has led her to having her teeth being removed. She cannot wear regular dentures because of the multiple physical issues she has with her jaw and mouth. This means that Sue has not eaten solid food in three years. Several oral surgeons have tried to help Sue, but the cost to fix these issues is astronomical. It will cost Sue over $80,000 to completely fix her mouth, which she cannot afford to do. So I'm asking the Premier, will you grant Sue financial assistance to cover the cost of this urgent medical procedure through OHIP? 
thank the member opposite for the question. Certainly, we have uh, many programs available for people that can't afford certain procedures or surgeries. I'd need to know more about your constituents' personal information. I'd be happy to look into it to see what we would be able to do specifically to help support her. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Sue's physical and mental health have continued to deteriorate, and I've sent the minister several letters uh, since October 2021, and her staff continues to tell us to wait for an answer and that an answer is coming. It is now the end of February 2022, so I will uh, hand uh, to a page if they could please take this uh, over to the minister. Uh, minister, it's unacceptable that my constituent has had to wait this long for an answer with continuous work uh, from my office. So in the hopes that she will now read this letter, I'm hoping that we will get the answer that we're looking for. Can the minister commit today to granting Sue the financial assistance that she needs so she can get the surgery that she so desperately requires? Minister of Health. I do thank the member for bringing this specifically to my attention, and I can certainly um, undertake to provide a response as quickly as possible. I can't commit at this moment because I need to understand the specific circumstances and what the issues are, but I will commit that I would look into this straight away for your constituent. The next question, the member for Cambridge. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. It was reported that 39 trucking businesses that were involved in the protest in Ottawa were shut down and put out of work after the Premier called the protest an, quote, illegal op occupation, end quote, rashly invoked a state of emergency and put in place emergency measures to shut down businesses without due process. Can the minister let us know what investigation or due process was afforded to these trucking businesses by the ministry when their businesses were shut down? To respond, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think we were uh, we were very clear, uh, and we had uh, uh, highlighted well in advance of taking action with respect to those people who were part of an illegal protest that enforcement was coming. Uh, speaker, we uh, uh, the premier, of course. Uh, instituted a state of emergency in the province of Ontario so that we could provide maximum assistance to the Ottawa Police Service. Uh, uh, now, having said that, uh, Speaker, uh, due diligence will be taken to, uh, to ensure that those uh, people who, have, uh, who may have their CVORs uh, revoked from them, that to ensure that they were, in fact, the people who were there, the rule of law will still be, uh, will still be followed, and uh, if they were part of an illegal protest, uh, there will have to, of course, be consequences for that, uh, for that action, uh, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you. Now that the Premier has withdrawn his state of emergency and the Premier, Premier's ally, the Prime Minister, did the same, are there any plans to allow for these 39 trucking businesses to get back to work? Government House Leader. Uh, speaker, to, to, be, to be very clear, uh, a vast majority of the people who, uh, 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 the truckers who were, are so important to the, this economy, were vaccinated or are vaccinated and were continuing to work during this, uh, this protest, Mr. Speaker. Let's also be very clear. What we saw in, in Ottawa, what we saw at Queen's Park and in other places, it wasn't just about truckers. Speaker, it wasn't just about truckers, and I think we do a disservice to those people who were there because of the high cost of living, who were there because the carbon tax was making it too difficult for farmers to fuel up their tractors, or whatever other reason they were there for, Mr. Speaker. We have to do a better job, I think, on both sides of this house, a better understanding what it was that brought people to protest illegally uh, on Parliament Hill and in other places across this country. So do we want people to get back to work? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Are we going to do everything that we can to build a better, stronger province of Ontario? Yes. Will we work with our partners to ensure that Canada is even stronger than before? Absolutely. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacocca. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, my office has been receiving many calls about the Northern Health Travel Grant. People are saying claims and appeals are taking a very long time, and constituents have reported back to me that appeals weren't even being heard for over a year. People are waiting for answers, and they're waiting for their money. They can't afford the health care they need. Premier, what is the government going to do 
to fix the Northern Health Travel Grant. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. The Northern Health Travel Grant, of course, is very important to uh, many people in the North who have to have medical procedures done, who need to travel from one place to another. We know this is very difficult in certain times of the year because of the, the times, the distances, the road conditions, and so on. But we have changed the system significantly to allow for people to be paid at the appropriate time. We do know that in the past, people had to wait for long periods of time. We are accelerating that procedures so that people are able to receive the help that they need. But I think it's also important that we're also advancing virtual health care. This isn't relevant for some people, I know that of course, but for many people it is that allows them to be able to receive the care they need in their own home community and uh, without the need for having the Northern Health Travel Grant. It is necessary for some situations, but virtual health care is going to make a huge difference in, in reducing the numbers of people that will need that. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. I've int introduced two bills to fix the Northern Health Travel Grant in my time at Queen's Park. The first time around, the, a member from Eglinton Lawrence said, the Northern Health Travel Grant is also currently undergoing an operational process review to correct inefficiencies and process bottlenecks. These changes and improvements will go a long way to addressing the concerns and improvements proposed by the members opposite. That was three years ago, and the problems still exist. People across the North are looking for answers. Virtual care is not the solution. You can't have heart surgery virtually. What has this government done to help the people who use this program? What is this government, when is this government going to keep its word, improve the Northern Health Travel Grant to ensure equitable access to health care for people in the North? Mr. Cole. Well, we are working on improving the Northern Ontario Travel Grant to make sure that the people who need it can receive their payment in a timely manner. We know that in the past there were long periods of time that passed before people were able to receive reimbursement. We want to make sure that they can receive the reimbursement as soon as possible because we know that there are significant costs related to this. Is the work done yet? No, we're still working on it, but we have made significant improvements in the last three or four years. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. I want to remind members that our pages are in the chamber to assist MPPs in appropriate ways, including delivering private notes and messages from one member to another. However, it's not appropriate to ask one of our pages to deliver documents during question period while you have the floor. And I would ask members to keep this in mind during future sittings of the Legislature. There being no further business at this time, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.